So I'm actually going to start this talk with a small confession. And that confession is, although while I was here doing my PhD in energy technology, for the longest time I didn't actually know how I was using electricity. And that was pretty embarrassing, and so eventually I picked up one of these. It's called a kilowatt, and what it allows you to do is plug in whatever electronics that you're interested in and measure the power out. And so I got really into this, like embarrassingly into this, annoying my housemates sort of into this, because I was just running around unplugging things, you know, leaving the refrigerator running through this for multiple days to get like a better data. Uh, and what I learned was actually kind of surprising to me. What I learned was that the things that I associate with, uh, uh, you know, modern life, the trappings, the things that allow me to access the internet, like my laptop or a monitor, these all use roughly, for me, about 50 watts. Even the uh, bathroom fan that we had was around there, and when you add up all the light bulbs that we had in our house, it was up there as well. And I expected our refrigerator to just be a huge power draw, but then, after getting that data over several days, it averaged, over the course of you know a day, something like double that amount. So your refrigerator might be newer, it certainly actually probably is, and your uh, laptop might be a little bit more efficient, but the exact number isn't exactly the point. The point is that we don't generate on the sort of 50 watt scale, and we don't even generate a thousand times, and often not even a million times that size. And that's because this is still the state of the art. Mechanical engines, just described to you, you're all experts now, uh, 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 they transport us, they keep us cool, and they generate over 80% of the electricity in the United States but they sort of create a problem, and the problem is that they're so big. In order to connect all of this generation to the sort of 50 watt devices that we all have in our houses, well, it requires an enormous amount of infrastructure. And so this creates also an opportunity, not, an opportunity not just for the third of the planet to live in countries that use 10 times less electricity per capita than you, the United States, and not just for the billion plus people who still don't have access to a reliable electric grid, but it even creates an opportunity for us here, because in places like New York City, over half of the cost of electricity is due to distribution and not to generation itself. So what if we could produce power at the human scale? And how? What would a technology that could take advantage of this opportunity look like? Well, we think it needs to be three things. First of all, it needs to be distributed, generate electricity where you want it at the levels that you need. The second is that it should be pretty efficient because for the sake of our climate and our future, it probably shouldn't be more carbon intensive than what we're already going for. And the third thing is we think it should be simple, not just technologically, but also from the user perspective. It should be able to plug in when you want and get the electricity that you want. And so obviously to uh, uh, re-envision the century-old uh, electric grid, we're looking to half-century-old technology. But in seriousness, half a century ago is the height of the space race. And we needed a solution for power in space for the simple reason that steam turbines don't work as well there. Uh, and so what we did is uh, NASA poured in a huge amount of uh, uh, resources in order to develop technologies that would actually, even today, seem pretty high tech. Solar panels, as we heard earlier today, even fuel cells and thermoelectrics, all of these flew in space for the first time in the 1960s. But of all of these sort of space race technologies, one of these, at least for us, kind of stood above the rest from the raw power, the raw performance perspective, and it's one you probably haven't heard of. It's called thermionic energy conversion. So a thermionic energy converter is probably the simplest heat engine that you can imagine. It's got a hot side, it's got a cool side, and a vacuum gap in between that thermally insulates them. And because of that vacuum gap, you can get really high temperature differences that, as we just learned, can drive a lot of power. And so back in the 1960s, uh, uh, researchers demonstrated efficiencies that were three times higher than the competing technologies like solar panels or thermoelectrics, and power densities that were just colossal, like a thousand times higher than a battery. So then what happened? Well, at the end of the space race, thermionics kind of got forgotten. It got a reputation of being an old-timey vacuum tube technology that had been tried before. And so we believe that this creates an opportunity to apply decades of innovations in materials and microfabrication in order to re-envision this technology and overall more than double the performance. And so that's where I sort of came in. At Stanford, along with Professor Ziek Shen, Nick Malosh, and Roger Howe, uh, I studied uh, new applications and new materials, new innovations towards thermionics. And in those days, we were focusing on uh, uh, basically power towers out in the desert combine cycles to increase the efficiency and therefore drive down the cost of these sorts of 
uh, power plants. But through the course of my PhD, and especially towards the end, I realized that the innovations that we had made were far broader than just increasing the efficiency of steam turbines out in the desert. And if you scale it down, just the device itself on a standalone basis could be really pretty incredible. What we realized was that we were really building towards a power plant on a chip, something that could have the potential to become the smallest, lightest engine on the planet, something that could be competitive with virtually any mechanical engine, uh, but with no moving parts. So let's imagine that we're successful, that your next generator is a spark reactor. Why would that matter? Well, for one, the lack of a small light engine is why your quadcopter flies for maybe 20 minutes, but your helicopter can fly you up and down a mountain for hours. And setting our sights even higher, we've learned through conversations with NASA that the promise of thermionics for space reactors is even larger today than it was in the 1960s. And in fact, the energy conversion branch chief, also chief technologist of the uh, power and propulsion division at NASA, thinks that our technology could be enabling to a manned mission to Mars. Because within a single calendar year, you can not only send someone there, but also bring them home. And finally, once they're home, uh, back on Earth, that's actually some of the most exciting opportunity, I think. Uh, because you know, some of our first prototypes, which we're just making now, uh, look a bit like this. And while we're not there yet, from the historical power density of thermionics, something this size could put out up to 50 watts. We're on our way there, and if we get there, it's not important just because that would power my old laptop, but because the International Energy Agency defines a family of five in a rural area as being on the grid at 250 kilowatt hours per year. When you translate that down to what a generator would have to operate at you know, during the waking hours, it's about 50 watts. So according to the IEA, one or two of these devices could be the difference between a family being off the grid or on the grid, but all without a grid. So we're just getting started at Spark, and I thank you for your attention. Next is Sarah.